Hi, Michael. Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you, Rachel. I am thrilled to be a part of this podcast. Yeah, thanks for being here. Could you briefly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Michael John Carley, and I wear a lot of different hats in the autism, Asperger, non-apparent disability, and diversity and inclusion worlds. Um, I have started nonprofits in New York. I have been a school consultant seemingly all over the place. Um, like everybody else in the field, I've written books and articles, and I am currently thrilled to be the consultant for disability inclusive culture at New York University. Cool. So your older son, CC, is also on the spectrum. Correct. And you were both diagnosed around the same time. Correct. Could you tell us about that? I certainly can. Um, I was enjoying a rather non-traditional but perfectly okay life as a starving playwright by night, but I had kind of a cool, stupid day job, as we used to call them back then, where I was the minor league diplomat at the United Nations representing a, an NGO called Veterans for Peace, which is pretty much like it sounds. It's kind of the left of center veterans organization in the United States. And during this time, uh, the world was starting to notice that our then two-year-old son, Cece, was doing a lot of the same telltale signs that other people see in their kids, uh, speech delay, motor skills issues, uh, instead of, you know, playing with toys, he's stacking dog food cans that we bought in bulk into these incredible pyramids in the hallway of our New York City apartment. So we knew that, you know, something was up. But when the clinicians in charge of his care started to look at dear old daddy out of the corner of their eyes because of the genetic nature of all this stuff, um, long story short, he and I were diagnosed in 2000 within one week of one another. Uh, both with Asperger's syndrome. I was actually later diagnosed with autism under the DSM-5 in 2014. Um, and he hasn't seeking any kind of, you know, reevaluation. Uh, but uh, yeah, there we were, the 36-year-old guy and the four-year-old son diagnosed within one week in the year 2000. Mm. What was that like for you to find out that news about yourself? It was actually really cool on a lot of levels. Uh, number one, it was cool from the level of distance because I was a father. You know, I didn't have to take in so much of the me, me, me factors if it felt overwhelming. You know, I had this duty as a father to learn as much as I could about this, you know, on behalf of my son. And so I could play the noble parent route when I felt overwhelmed by what it meant to me. But then when I wasn't feeling overwhelmed, I would, you know, accept of what it meant to me. And what it meant to me was an answer to a lifetime of sort of, you know, being disliked by people that kind of thought you were, I don't know what kind of words I can use on your podcast, Rachel, but um, not a nice person, <laughs> shall we say. Okay. And yet on the other side of things, there were lots of people who would be like, oh, Carly, he's a tell it like it is kind of guy. And I knew that both of these, you know, encampments were completely wrong in terms of their understanding of what made me tick. But I didn't have an answer for it. And I'm certainly not about to go hang out with people that don't like me. So, you know, I just went and hung out with the people that did like me. Uh, I think that I naturally then gravitated towards the two worlds that I just told you about because of the fact that uh, they permitted behavioral differences, whereas the corporate nine to five, you know, field certainly did not. Um, in theater, if you're not a little weird, it's kind of hard to find work. And, you know, in the field of, you know, where there's dying kids all over the place um, and you're part of the, the engine that's saving lives, you get a free pass if you say an inappropriate thing to your boss every once in a while or step on the wrong person's toes. Uh, if you're able to accomplish that kind of work, it really is about being good at the work as opposed to the corporate nine to five when you can be good at your work. But if you don't fit in socially, you're probably going to be out the door at some point soon. So I found my niches and, but I still, you know, somewhere had this understanding that, you know, whether I found my niches or not, the reasons why I was different had to do with defect and had to do with the fact that I wasn't, you know, let's say as good a person as everybody else. And when you find out that your differences are based on your wiring and not on your character, which is what you were led to believe all throughout your life. And which was also a very convenient way for other people to think of you. Um, the 
biblical difference in terms of how you view yourself. Um, I wish I had the words to explain to you and your listeners. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can just imagine that feeling of liberation, validation. Amen. Amen. Viewers can't see that I'm nodding emphatically to her over Zoom. (laughs) (laughs) So what are some ways that autism affects your daily life now? Well, I would say I've never been really that into the whole friends concept. You know, I see my wife with these friends that she's had all her lives. And, you know, I, I see the, the benefit that it gives to her. And I think it's really cool. But I look at that in the context of would I want something like that? And the answer is no, no, absolutely not. Why? Why do people need this stuff? You know, um, I need closer relationships with the people that I work with than most people. And, you know, for sometimes that's a boundary issue that has to be explained. So, um, but I do need that sense of passion and of the feeling that we're all on the same page to do good for the rest of the planet. Uh, and it's not like I don't have friends. I do have them, but I don't need them in the same capacity. You know, I can see a friend after, you know, not having seen them for two years and it won't be any big reunion. We'll just pick up where we left off two years ago, you know, kind of like it's no big deal. Uh, and you know, the other thing too, is that, you know, I think that as a result, you know, I really enjoy, you know, my time, let's say with my kids and my family a lot more than the next person. Um, I don't have a need to be bowling night on Tuesday, you know, guy, you know, um, I just don't. And so that's one aspect of it. I would say that, you know, I'm always still going to be a TMI kind of person. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say also that, um, as I get older, I become more grateful because I feel a lot, I feel a lot younger, I think, than other people my same age. And I think that that's going to carry me well into old age. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, I don't think as much, I'm as much of a Debbie Downer as, as other people my, my same age. So I think that that's really cool. How old are you? I'm 55. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, but... I also, you know, I've also been somebody who loves the way my brain works. I've never, you know, when I was a kid, I'd never, you know, beat myself up for the fact that the grownups were criticizing me for the fact that my brain worked differently than others. Um, You know, there was a part of me that was always kind of like, are you out of your mind? This is awesome. You know, if you could, if you could experience this, you would totally change your tune. Trust me. Could you elaborate more on that for obviously people who don't have autism, like, what do you mean by your brain works differently? I would say, I would say, you know, that for other people to have autism defined, they sometimes need things like motor skills issues, inability with eye contact, you know, some of the checklists that you and I just talked about. But if you were to ask me, and I think lots of people on the spectrum, well, what does it feel like? And we don't, think we don't see ourselves with different motor skills. You know, we don't see that as a daily part of our lives. That's something that other people notice. We don't notice that. Um, We may notice other people's disapproval if they're loud enough about it. And frequently, unfortunately, they still are. But, you know, internally, how do I view this? I view this as a different way of processing thoughts, a different way of processing experiences, and uh, a different way of processing emotions. And, you know, sometimes I think that you come to a place where really what I would consider to be the only real detriment that exists for people on the spectrum. Um, I don't care about the culture clash with the neurotypical world. I think the rest of the world can change infinitely more than we need to change, because I think we have better ideas about how the world should be run, quite frankly, if I have to be honest. But the one aspect for folks like myself, which we need to do a better job of acknowledging and then doing something about is the emotional regulation piece. Most adults on the spectrum do not have unhappy lives because they didn't get a passing grade in the social skills class. They don't have unhappy lives because they didn't do a good job in the mock interview. They have a hard time because of their challenges towards emotional regulation. And I'm no exception, but it's something that through, you know, all these accidents like the theater stuff where you have to understand what it's like to be in another person's shoes or being more physically in control of your body because everybody's watching you on stage and a director's telling you, why are you going all crazy with your hands like that? Um, You know, that you become more aware of. 
and also just in the capacity of learning how to teach other people how to communicate because if you are that uber communicative person that is not so good at lying you're going to make the people around you if they allow it better communicators with each other because True. you're going to get away from the euphemisms you're going to get away from the soliloquies you're going to get away from the sarcasm you're going to get away from the nonverbal communication and you're going to be able to you know teach the universe which i think is becoming more text based anyway um, you know, really how to communicate so much better than we usually do. Mm -hmm. More direct and straight to the point, getting rid of all that fluff. Exactly. I mean, look at how the dating scene has changed for everybody. I mean, it's, it's all based, you know, on information through dating apps right now. You know, the whole, the days that, you know, when I was young and, you know, there were certain expectations about, you know, winks and nods and bars, you know, and that that was, you know, part of the flirtation devices, um, you know, the, the critics who say, oh, well, romance is dying. And I say, good. I think that romance was a ton of crap that just delayed the relationship in a large <laughs> capacity. So, you know, I, if you want, you know, to speed up a relationship very, like by like three months, there's a wonderful uh, thing called the 36 questions. It was part of a New York Times article a long time ago. Look it up on the Internet. You can oh, say. I think I've you, heard about this. Yes. Uh, in a TED radio hour. On love yeah, or be. something. Yeah. Okay, be. go yep. on. Yep. You sit down and, you know, you with a potential partner, you go through that over the course of like two and a half to four hours, you'll shave four months off the development of your relationship. Right. You'll know right off the bat whether it's going to work or not. No, because there's the 37th question about, you know, whether there's sexual chemistry, but that's not on the test. Okay. <laughs> and we'll circle back to, to talking about sex later in this conversation. Awesome. 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 Um, so Michael, you've also done a lot of traveling in your life, you know, with your work with the United Nations, and also you spent some time in Eastern Europe after graduating from college. Correct. So what have you learned about yourself from being on the road? Wow. That's a really great way to put the question. Um, I think that I've learned that I can exist in any atmosphere. And I wish I could sell the benefits of travel and how that teaches that to the world, not just other people on the spectrum. Um, travel, if we look at it from my experiences of running from cops in Eastern Europe, um, playing an eighth rate Jack Kerouac for the cheapest graduate thesis imaginable and living out of your car for five months, you know, working odd jobs to pay for food and gas. You know, from my end of the spectrum, that's great. But I really firmly believe that a significantly challenged individual on the spectrum can gain the exact same lessons by being taught and learning how to cross the street by themselves and buying a slice of pizza all on their own. You know, what we're after when we travel are a couple of things. There's a removal from what existed before and an entry into unknown territory. And the removal from what existed before is so important because when you are that individual on the spectrum and there's been some embarrassing moments, there's been the meltdowns, there's been the blow ups, there's been the, you know, the family difficulties, all that sort of jazz travel allows us to escape from that. And you know that the people that are surrounding you are giving you a clean slate. They're not remembering the fight from three months ago and wondering when that's going to happen. People don't really understand how crucial that is to get away from those atmospheres. Even when people say, Oh, I forgot about that incident. No, you didn't. It's part of your makeup. It's part of your DNA. It's a part of the relationship now. So when you then get to go transpose yourself into a place where none of those memories exist, it's an absolute chance to try new things, to try new social skills. And, you know, if it's a situation where you're, let's say, on the road, maybe, you know, if you completely fall on your face with a new device that you, you know, decide to try out, who cares? Big whoop. You're never going to see these people again. Go try again with the modified lessons that you learned in the next town you're in. Mm -hmm. So that's heaven. But the other thing, too, obviously, that I think you know from, you know, your organization is, you know, that um, you're learning about different cultures. And, you know, one of the beautiful things I find about autism is how, you know, the, uh, the clinicians sometimes will never be able to pin it down because of the moving target throughout cultures of how, let's say one particular cultural attribute of the autism spectrum gets passed through the cultural filters in the United States. And yet that resonates, let's say, maybe as a negative where in you know, Sri Lanka, 
it's going to resonate as a positive, you know, and this is what renders like all autism spectrum, you know, global studies kind of moot, which you and I talked about earlier, mm -hmm. is that you really can't quantify it that way. Um, and that to me is beautiful. These behavioral differences pass through those cultural filters and makes you more of a pluralist. Um, I was also, I should add, I don't think you and I did talk about this, but I was partially raised by grandparents. And this was what really set me off on the whole pluralism idea, because when you're raised only by your parents, you get this one idea of one generation's way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And it's this long, painful process of learning how to realize that your peers are creating a completely new way of doing things, because that's your generation and how to separate itself from the previous generation. But when you're partially raised by people of a completely different generation than your parents, it's not that you go from one to two. It's that you conceive of the fact that there's not one, there's multiple. And what else is out there? Holy cow, how cool is that? Yeah. And I'll only conclude by saying that I learned a tremendous amount recently by spending six, six years taking care of in-laws in the Midwest after being you know, an East Coast person, grew up in New England and lived most of my life in New York City. And that is that sometimes you could maybe make the argument that because they don't have an ocean to stare at, that, you know, like where we come from, you know, we stare at an ocean and we think, wow, what's life like way over there? That's just a part of our DNA is to have that kind of wonder. And we don't have the possibility of doing that. Of course, you start to imagine ideas like, well, why would I ever want to leave here? Right here is fine. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's usually just that first step somewhere else that kind of broadens your horizons, not to be too cliche, but then your your eyes are opened and you're like, wow, actually there are so many differences, but also so many commonalities, which brings us together just as humans. And that's so fascinating. Correct. 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 Yeah. Well said. So at that time that you were traveling, you weren't diagnosed yet, but looking back on those adventures, what can you share about traveling as an autistic person? I think that, well, first I have to separate between foreign travel and let's say the five months living out of my car in this country. Okay. The five months living out of my car in this country, you were going to be interpreted as weird because nobody else had any other explanation for it. And they wondered why you were weird. Um, I think when you do a lot of foreign travel, people um, chalk up the reasons why you're weird to being a foreigner. Mm -hmm. And so you almost kind of get a freer pass for it. And there's a remarkable um, uh, higher degree of people on the spectrum who, when they partner, they partner with people from different cultures, neurotypicals. Oh, interesting. And I think that that's, you know, that's part of the reason for that. Um, but I think too, that, you know, if you're willing to embrace qualities that other, that resonate with other people, um, like I was, I was always petrified of slipping through the cracks. And so I had to be the guy that worked harder than the next person. Always. I had to, you know, be the best, you know, at everything I was doing. It's just the sense of urgency that I had in me. And, you know, hopefully that's what's going to resonate with other people rather than, and let it overcome the fact that, yeah, you are a little weird to them. Um, but when you're traveling in a foreign, you know, situation, you don't need as much of that stuff. Um, I think people want to learn from you more just because you are a foreigner. They're more generous um, in that capacity. And, you know, like I said, I mean, they give you freer passes for the, you know, the occasional oddity. Mm -hmm. Right. Changing topics, Michael. In 2003, you founded the Global and Regional Asperger Syndrome Partnership, or GRASP, which turned into the largest membership organization in the world for adults on the autism spectrum. So what made you want to create GRASP? Um, well, need. Uh, I think that I also had seen right before GRASP formed that it was going to work. And the story goes something like this. I'm still doing all that work in Iraq, repairing water treatment facilities. And during my diagnosis and as the responsible parent, I'm trying to sponge up as much information on this stuff as I can. And one of the places where that search led me to was a support group for adults on the spectrum that was happening in Manhattan. And it was run by a guy named Harry Feigenbaum. He was a very kindly uh, grandfather. Um, of a kid on the spectrum. He was not on the spectrum himself. 
And there were about six people on the spectrum of the group, and there were about 15 people by email in circulation. Uh, it was a monthly group. And I went to a couple of meetings and kind of felt like, okay, I got what I needed, so I'm going to take off now. And the woman approached me who had organized the whole thing and said, Harry's going to be stepping down. Would you be up for taking over the group? Long story short, because I hemmed and hawed because of all the Iraq um, uh, obligations, but of course I ended up taking the, over the group with uh, a friend named Daniel Jimenez. And what ended up happening was that instead of six people at a meeting, it was 45 people at a meeting within 18 months. Within those 18 months, it was three times a month, not one time a month. And within those 18 months, we had 440 people in circulation and not 15 people in circulation. And what had happened was not that Daniel or I were doing any great brainy job at facilitating. What had happened was that the people that were running the group had the same juice as everybody else in the group. And when you've been shouted down as inappropriate and told not to say this, not to say that, in all this fear-based junk that we throw at everybody, you know, not just people on the spectrum sometimes, um, that there's an incredible trust that suddenly, you know, envelops people. And of course it becomes something that you want to go to. And I'll never forget this one time when I could see there was this one guy in one group and he was struggling as to whether to admit something or not. And it was clear that he, you know, admitted this maybe decades before and being, been shouted down for it. And then you see him admit it. And the person sitting next to him goes, I've been there, man. I hear you. That too is biblical yeah. to see that kind of a reaction. So um, we'd struck a nerve and the world was taking notice. It was a Manhattan thing. So I started getting speaking engagements because of this. And there was one gig in particular at the New York College of Medicine, um, weirdly enough, right after the day after we invaded Iraq. So I'd been up all night. It was like this confluence of crazy events. I'm like dead tired as I get to this gig. Um, but um, immersed in the long line of mothers that usually waited back in the day to talk to you after you'd spoken, you know, with let me tell you about my son. Um, there was this guy who was wearing a really good suit and his name turned out to be David Tobis and he ran the fund for social change. And when he came up to me, he said, what's your pipe dream for an organization? We'll fund it. So we were kind of already started. We knew that what we, you know, it was the right idea at the right time. And by the time I left 10 years later, I had a career in the autism Asperger world and we had 28 chapters all across North America, all run by people on the spectrum, serving people on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so important to give them that space to to vent and just feel that they're not alone in what's happening to them. You have to remember that back then, people didn't think about autistic adults or adults on the spectrum could organize. People didn't think that we could, you know, convene in a social capacity. And so because of that, adults on the spectrum were really isolated back then. Really, really isolated. So... When here we are organizing all these adults on the spectrum and the world is going, oh, um, I certainly didn't think that that could happen. And I'm actually still bothered by this, you know, years later, because the concept of shared experience, you know, it works for everybody. It's worked for, you know, breast cancer survivors. It's worked for returning war vets. And it was just another example of why people robbed us of the humanity because they've been looking at the medical model only of what autism could possibly look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were there spinoff groups for support groups for parents or family members? We did a few. Um, we, did, we had a parent support group that was fairly active. My, my experience with parent support groups is that nobody goes forever. You know, they come to get their questions answered and then they kind of take off, which is normal, I think. Um, but, you know, when you're somebody who's, you know, looking for friends and looking for to build a life, I think that that's when you're going to stay at that support group, you know, usually a lot longer. And that's not to, you know, consider what the parents needs are as a negative. Uh, we did that for a while. Um, and I think we had some funding issues to keep it going. So but yeah, we've had sibling support groups. We had an LGBTQ support specific support group. Um, we've had women's support groups. Um, uh, a lot of our guys are, you know, they're the heterosexual guys, you know, they're kind of, you know, 
um, starving, should we say. So yeah. sometimes women's groups are a good idea. Mm. Um, but yeah, we've had all kinds of groups. We even had in New York City, we had a um, the IDT Telephone Corporation, which is was, I don't, know, I don't know if they're still around, but um, they're owned by the Hasidic Jewish population. And we even had a support group, which oddly enough, I ran for the Brooklyn uh, Hasidic Jewish project. Back then. Okay. Do you know if there's anything currently available for people in the times of COVID? Are there some kind of online support groups that people can attend? My, my understanding is that nobody has really struck one that's really working um, for a lot of people. For one thing, a lot of the support groups, I think, especially since I left Grasp in 2013, had just all kind of dissipated. It's kind of sad to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if it's, you know, because the organizations just couldn't really adapt, including my old organization, which breaks my heart. But, um, but I also wonder if maybe it's progress, if maybe because, you know, we really have kind of all changed the world together uh, to be more behaviorally permissive so that when Autistic Johnny walks down the streets and he's flapping his arms, you know, 20 years ago, it was called the cops territory. And now it's, oh, he's, he's making an expression of pleasure. Mm-hmm. that's a huge difference. And mm-hmm. I wonder, you know, like one of the things I used to argue with the Autism Society of America with all the time with, you know, was the idea that, you know, I assumed sometimes that they and other, you know, monoliths were under the impression that the ideal nonprofit is one that has a $15 million a year budget. And to me, no, if you're a nonprofit, your greatest achievement is your own abolition. You're working for the day in which you are not needed anymore. There's no greater compliment than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point to make. I mean, even in my line of work, offering clinical services, we're hopefully working so that we're not having to be there anymore. Absolutely. The whole notion that when you have a patient, that you're supposed to have that patient for the rest of your life. No, you know, your biggest achievement is that clinical professional is indeed, you know, to lose the income. So you're absolutely right, Rachel. Yep. Let's talk about your books. So you've published two so far, and you're currently waiting to publish a third one. So the first book, um, which was published in 2008, is titled Asperger's from the Inside Out. What inspired you to write this book? There was no book at that time for adults being diagnosed in retrospect. That was the first um, kind of... It's still kind of the only book written for adults diagnosed late in life, but lots of other books have incorporated chapters about that or been heavily influenced by that concept, I would say. But uh, that was kind of an imperative uh, at the time because it was literally maybe hundreds of thousands of us were going through that same experience after DSM-4, after this uh, night, no, you read that article. No, it was the same year I got diagnosed, 2000. Um, There was an article in the Sunday Times Magazine called The Little Professor Syndrome. It got at least 20,000 New Yorkers diagnosed. I know that. Um, And so all across the country, you had, you know, many, many more. And, you know, those early years of 2001 to 2005, you know, you really might have seen maybe even seven digits um, of people being diagnosed in retrospect. So there really wasn't a book for them. Mm -hmm. So that was the main impetus for that particular book. And the second book really came out, I, my second executive directorship focused on employment with an organization called ASTEP, which is now called Integrate. Um, I was their founding executive director for three years, and it was working with Fortune 500 companies within the New York City area, trying to convince or trick them to hire a lot of our really brilliant kids coming out of college that were on the autism spectrum, but that, you know, were getting degrees. And I had a really cool editor at that particular publishing house right now uh, who was like, well, I'd love to do an employment book with you because of your experience. And whereas I'd written the first book for, you know, adults being diagnosed in retrospect, I, I was maybe looking at being like the 10th person to write, you know, a book on employment issues for people on the spectrum. And <clears throat> not only did I not want to do that, but I was also just coming off a very unsuccessful, but kind of fun um, venture. It was actually the only for-profit thing I've ever tried in my life. Um, it was uh, it was a uh, st- social media startup for um, 
uh, collaborating on startup organizations yourselves. And it didn't go anywhere, even though it had really incredible people behind it. Um, but my editor said, you've got all this research done on unemployment. Uh, why don't you make or write the first book on how to process unemployment in a healthy way for adults on the spectrum? And that was her idea, not mine. Um, and it was brilliant because we do. We have a 75 to 85 percent unemployment rate still as adults on the spectrum. So I think that there, including my old organization, there's probably five well-known employment organizations in the autism field that get a lot of press. And they get a lot of credit, which they deserve. And you put all of them together, and I'll bet you that in the best year, the cumulative number of full-time jobs they got adults on the spectrum was less than 100. Wow. And if you do the math of you know, a prevalence rate of 1 in 54 in a nation of 319 million, and the working age is 21 to 65, and you will, I think, very, very quickly realize that uh, that's one page out of War and Peace, that there may be <laughs> like 3 million people that need assistance right now. Mm -hmm. That's not even including the people who are not technically unemployed, but have maybe just given up on looking for work. Is it discouraged workers? Yes, thank you. You're making a brilliant observation because one of the things I learned in the, re in the research for that is that no statistics lie like labor statistics do. When you look at unemployment statistics, they don't take into, into account the people that have been on unemployment benefits and that when the unemployment benefits ended and they still didn't have a job, those people are not taken into account in those statistics. People who decided, I can't work anymore, so I'm just going to go on disability. You know, they might have been, let's say, on the autism spectrum or had other non-apparent disabilities or other physical disabilities. And they had regular, well-paying jobs until, you know, the financial crisis hits. They can't get work again. They have to go on disability to get health insurance as well as something in the bank. And those people are not taken into account when unemployment statistics are derived. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a mess getting a real clear picture of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are tons of categories of people that don't fit into the mold. I've read an article recently about this because in previous episodes of the podcast, we've opened up the conversation about inclusion in the workplace, asking for accommodations when needed. So what advice would you give to autistic adults who are struggling to cope with unemployment? Lots of things. Um, obviously, buy my book. It'll give you a better answer than I'm going to give here. But of course, that's extremely selfish of me to say. <laughs> we'll put links to it in the show notes. <laughs> um, I think, number one, understand that momentum is your best friend. When you take a week out to binge watch a show on the couch, that's not going to be good. But at the same point, you can't just be sending out resumes for longer than two hours a day. That's just pointless. And cold leads are really not helpful in the end. Um, parents seem to love cold leads, so I understand sometimes if you have to do cold leads to satisfy your support systems that you're living with, you know, and it may be unfortunate. Um, but I would also say you need to start getting a little creative about what the employment is. If you've got that kind of time on your hands, learn a trade. You know, I don't care how many PhDs you have. If you become a plumber, okay, you're always going to have work. Electricians, carpenters, um, even welders, you know, you pass one exam after becoming a welder in New York and you're earning a six figure income. You know, it's one of the things where Temple Grandin and I actually um, wrote an article together a long time ago because we had this one, you know, I regard myself as, you know, very progressive. Temple, I think, kind of regards herself as old school. But the one thing where I was able to totally go old school with her on was the idea that we need to go back to the days of the 1940s and the 1950s when, you know, you had trades being taught within those schools in 11th or 12th grade to the kids that just weren't going to go to college. And there's no crime in not going to college. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have that anymore. We've demanded that everybody get the same education um, and that everybody go to college. And it's not only diluted the quality of a college education in a vast way, but it's really screwed a lot of the kids that could have become very successful tradespeople you know, the job in the jobs that are always going to be needed. So, you know, she and I wrote a piece in my HuffPost column, just basically saying, get rid of the 12th grade, if not the 11th grade curriculums as well, you know, and let's just get back these kids into their shops. Yeah. I found that article. I'll post a link to it too. 
Wow, you've really done your homework, great. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a big deal, Michael John Carley, so I just wanted to prepare myself. <laughs> um, let's talk about your third book, The Big Fat Sex Book, as you like to call it. Big Fat Sex Book. Honestly, when I was writing, ten, you know, when I was running grass for 10 years, and when you're, you know, in charge of the largest membership organization for adults on the spectrum in the world, um, you can be doing a crappy job, you can be doing a good job, but you're going to hear more stories from adults on the spectrum than anybody in the world. And every once in a while, you would get a phone call. And it would be from a mom, and she would say, do you know of any disability-friendly sex workers? My son is 36 years old, and he's never had an experience. And I would think to myself, okay, how do I feel about that? And in the end, um, I would think, you know what? I've got no right to judge. And if that's the only experience that individual has and it causes them to smile and thinking about it, um, would I rather have that individual enjoy that or have nothing at all because of some moral pretense? I would rather have that individual have had that experience in a nanosecond. It's a go. Um, my wife kind of stepped in and said, so you're going to throw your career away to become a pimp? <laughs> and I had to put it on hold. But the sexuality component, like the employment component, was one that I was realizing in those 10 years, I would want to do stuff on as a specialized subject later on. We've talked about the employment piece. The other hidden can of worms, which is really, um, well, less so now, but at the time when I would share this with friends in the field um, that ran other organizations, you know, they would say, Michael, we love you, but, you know, in, you can be a trailblazer in a lot of things, Michael, but on this one, you need to shut up. And I would get calls every once in a while uh, by people who would say, I have just been diagnosed as on the spectrum and I work as an actress in the adult film industry. Okay. Or um, I'm a sex worker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a situation where you suddenly realized, wow, um, you know, here we are having all these demonizing talks about, you know, porn and people on the spectrum and these BS constructs that people put, you know, about things like porn addiction out there. Right. And, you know, lo and behold, we got a new can of worms of there's a lot of people on the spectrum, you know, in the industry. Why were they emailing you? Because they wanted to know how to process their diagnosis like anybody else who had just been diagnosed with Asperger's. Wow. You know, they wanted help. They wanted, you know, what does this mean for my life? And, you know, it was certainly a learning experience, you know, for me, um, because, yeah, you know, at the time, I think we all wanted to think of porn actors as um, all being trafficked and all being coerced um, and all being on drugs to get through the scene that they were shooting, because that was the only way they could make it through. Um, and it wasn't like that. It was a lot of choice. And dare I say it, part of it, you know, not a life that I would want, but part of it was very healthy decision making. And, you know, I mean, if you really look at it from the context of does everybody love their job? Um, I think that gives you a good enough of a start. And then suddenly you realize, you know, that when it comes to people on the spectrum, um, yeah, there were other people that, you know, kind of still wanted the picket fence American dream in their future. And so they wanted out and they wanted to hopefully be able to put this in their past. But there were other people that said, you know what? I like sex and I suck at relationships and the money's great. This is perfect for me. So it was a real eye opener for me. And I just, what I started to also see too was just like all developmental experiences that when individuals on the spectrum throughout our history have been taught areas of sexuality, we get the censored version. We never have gotten the same kind of options that other people were exposed to. And that is, just such a cruel, cruel thing to do to a human being, um, you know, and whether it was things like relationship constructs like monogamy or non-monogamy, um, you know, really exploring things like that. I was really also turned on by the book Sex at Dawn. I remember when that came out and, you know, suddenly was, you know, educated to the fact that, um, you know, when we were um, hordes of hunter gatherers, you know, traveling the world in packs of 30 to 300, that um, it wasn't just that we weren't monogamous. It was just that the idea of any kind of a possession, if you were a hunter gatherer, whether that was, you know, the sofa that you want to take with you to the next plane or a human being was just idiotic. 
because you know life was very precarious that day. And it wasn't because of some stupid minor league porn fantasy. It was because of the concept of uncertain paternity. Life was very challenging back then. The grownups died a lot. But if a kid, if nobody knew who the father of the kid was, then that child would never be ostracized and would always be taken care of by the village. Um, you know, and you know, this was just stuff that was also fascinating. And I remember as a kid too, um, if you play guitar and I was a kid that played guitar, I was in a lot of awful bands, but I was a really good guitar player. So you're going to have experiences, you know, whether you're on the spectrum or not, if you can play guitar really well, when you grew up in the era that I grew up in at least. And, you know, I loved it because it gave me a way to communicate in ways that I wasn't very good at communicating otherwise. Um, and, you know, I think I appealed to people because I was a little bit more honest. I just didn't have the social construct to be a douchebag like other people did. It's not that I was a better person. Um, but I also grew up in families that had their share of conservative members and who thought they were really, and members who thought they were really progressive. And I was kind of fascinated by how I saw the, the conservative ones really lamenting as they grew older that their ideas about a healthy sex life really had not panned out and it was too late and how sad they were, how mm. sad they were. And then on the other side, I saw this recklessness of, you know, people invalidating, you know, the, the, the emotions of people that they supposedly said that they loved in the name of being progressive. And I thought of how selfish that looked like. So it was always a subject that fascinated me, always. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, especially when the Spectrum stuff came into mind, I was like, I have to do something about this one too, along with employment. Yeah. Could you explain why people on the Spectrum are given that censored version? I think people are too scared of what's going to happen to us. I think that we have an, a society that is maybe the most scared of sex on the planet, which is ridiculous because of how you know, privileged we are economically. Um, we allow these hurtful, dumb, mean, scary, um, punitive uh, legislature into how we rule what basically should be a biological response and a desire for pleasure that everyone deserves and has a right to. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say enough of, about how just destructive Americans especially are when it comes to healthy attitudes about sexuality. I think that everywhere on planet earth, we try to control what is a biological thing with social constructs, with culturally created manifestations. And it's never going to work. Biology is never going to listen to a, to a, you know, a social construct. And it's one of the things where, you know, I'm a dumb straight white guy in a lot of ways. And I know that it's one of the reasons why, you know, all of the LGBTQ population that read this book, you know, that gave it, you know, the massive thumbs up is that when you really actually just focus on the biology, that, you know, a frenulum and a clitoris are just going to respond to whatever they want to respond to, no matter what kind of a, you know, society you find yourself in, um, that, you know, that makes things a little bit easier to comprehend. And it also shows just how just mean and stupid we are about this subject. Yeah, I can definitely um, speak to understanding the difference in cultures from having moved to Spain. Yes. And you see it even just on the streets here. People are not afraid to show affection. You'll see people making out on the bus. And, you know, at first, my American instinct was to be kind of grossed out. And I'm like, man, they should get a room. How could they do this? People are watching. And I felt so uncomfortable. And then over time, you know, with many conversations with my husband, who's from here, um, I've learned to, to kind of appreciate it and applaud them even for just how beautiful it is to be in love and to want to express that and not care what people think about you. Where on the other side, back in the States, you know, even just um, growing up thinking about how uh, how my mom would like change the channel on the TV if something sexual would come up. And it was just so awkward, even as an adolescent watching something sexual with my family members. And I'm like, oh, we just don't talk about this stuff. I didn't really fully answer your question because the danger, obviously, that a lot of people have, which is very real for adults on the spectrum, though, is, you know, when you're sexually underdeveloped because you haven't had a healthy curriculum, 
um, of course you're going to turn to the online stuff. And we have a lot of our folks that have found themselves on the sex offender registry. And I don't care what anybody says. If I have a client or a patient that is in any kind of a threat to be on that registry, I say, why do you still have your passport before they take it away? Get out of the country because your life is over if you're on that. Mm. We live in such a punitive system that especially people on the spectrum who just want to get the interview with the cop over with, that they'll sign anything. And we've had so many people that have been railroaded onto that registry that do not deserve to be on the registry. The registry is something that I think was a good idea to start out with. And unfortunately, uh, local prosecutors just use it as a way to win elections and to look tough on crime by increasing their numbers against really innocent people. I mean, especially, you know, when we lie to our citizens and we say that we're a society that doesn't tolerate rape, you know, are you kidding me? Seen our prison system yet? When we all, you know, nudge each other and go wink, wink, yeah, that guy's going to get it in prison. Don't tell me we don't tolerate rape. We don't not only not, you know, not only do we tolerate it, we encourage it. It's still a huge part of our fabric. So that's what parents are usually scared of. But unfortunately, you know, for all of us right now, you know, porn is the sex ed because none of us are comfortable taking over for porn to be the teachers anymore. This problem with not educating people on the spectrum or people with special needs, not educating them properly, is really just kind of a reflection, like how we were saying, of how the cultural views how the culture views sex in general. So what are some of your ideas to to combat, you know, the Puritan values or how much religion plays a part in society? It's a hard question because I, I, I think I'm still a little stupefied by why we've allowed, you know, such harmful ideals to flourish. I'm still a little confused by that. I think that, you know, we have a history of trying to nobly give everyone a voice in the name of pluralism. But if you want to take your particular community's views and instill it into a public atmosphere, i.e. the separation between church and state being destroyed, um, that that's really one of the first uh, bad signals that we send to these harmful purveyors because we're legitimizing them. Um, You know, I think that, uh, you know, when we've allowed that stuff into our schools, you know, where we still have you know, in the dumb, dumb Midwest, you still have, you know, um, abstinence programs, which lie through their teeth to kids, you know, instead of healthy sex ed programs in the public schools sometimes. Um, You know, that's, that's only occurred because people have let them. And I think we've just, haven't we learned enough about maybe not allowing people the keys to the entire castle? Um, you know, and, and letting science dictate science. I mean, you know, in, in America, you've seen it. Um, you know, we never used to politicize health care. We, we never used to politicize education. But it's all become, you know, this partisan background. And, you know, because of the fact that we're so terrified of healthy sexuality, um, you know, we just let it roam free. And honestly... My only idea, and it's not that good a one, is, again, focusing on the biology. And if you just listen to that and listen to the science of what your body wants, um, and that if you have a kink, understand it's not going to go anywhere. So, you know, maybe a painful conversation needs to be had. um, And just understanding that this is all really healthy, not unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So how is sex ed taught in mainstream classrooms now? Because I remember when I was... So I, I remember the the day we all went to the auditorium when I was in fifth grade and they put on that video about <laughs> how people get pregnant. Um, but we didn't learn about masturbation. Are they teaching that now? I don't think so, no. Okay. No. And especially on the autism spectrum, that is absolutely essential, uh, especially for more significantly challenged individuals. You know, one of the things that... Um, I I always found when I first entered this field and I was sort of, you know, in my learning curve of going from, you know, center to center and listening to everybody and, you know, asking questions of people. Um, The people that 
um, gave me the grant to start grass. They gave me this long fellowship first, you know, where I could really go and absorb. And one of the light motifs that I heard all the time was a group of clinicians who've been in charge of significantly challenged folks. They all had a story where a guy on the spectrum, quote unquote, whipped it out and started to masturbate, you know, in a quote unquote inappropriate setting. And one of the things I'm sort of thinking in my mind is they're telling me the stories of how freaked out they were. You know, and, you know, obviously, you know, having to, you know, somehow corral it, probably not very gracefully, though. And yet coming together at the bar as clinicians to share the story. And if they were uncomfortable about it, they were made more comfortable about it because of the peer to peer experience with their colleagues. OK, well, I was thinking in my head, OK, I'm that nonverbal person. And I've just discovered the greatest thing since sliced bread. This <laughs> is awesome. This is fabulous. And if a clinician that I have trusted before comes in a panic over to me, yelling at me, grabbing my arm, moving me, you know, and kind of, you know, let's say they're destroying the moment, you know, mm -hmm. am I really going to trust them again? You know, has my relationship with them been changed? And now that I have, you know, a really bad memory, to process, do I get a chance with my peers to work this out? No. Right. And the other thing too about all this stuff too is that it's like if, you know, if people who are significantly challenged were not given um, instructions about the changes that their bodies would go through during puberty, um, I just sort of, I knew from experience that, I mean, if you think you've seen behavioral problems out of that individual, you ain't seen nothing yet. Until those changes happen and nobody prepped you for it. Right. That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Um, I don't think there's a lot much different from the days of our sex ed class. You know, they, um, you know, it's a biology class in a lot of ways. It's a, uh, you know, um, class on safe sex practices, I think, a lot more maybe than when we were kids. And I also think that there's a lot more of um, a self-esteem portion of today's sex ed, especially targeted at girls, which is vastly needed. Um, but are we really being inclusive to the point where we're talking about LGBTQ, you know, issues in the sex mm -hmm. ed class? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And that just furthers, you know, we don't even have to be bigots, you know, just the exclusion of that in a sex ed curriculum stigmatizes the LGBTQ yeah. community right there and then. Um, are we talking about procedures that could actually make us confident that we could be treasured lovers of somebody. No, absolutely not. It's just all about the pregnancy issue. Um, Al Vernacchio is a guy who wrote a book that I really liked when I was first starting this, and he has a great quote. We are still teaching kids that we do not want them to have great sex. Hmm. Yeah. I will say one thing, though. I did run a successful program with a 13 year old boy, and it was a masturbation program. He was a big guy. Um, so, also had some behavioral outbursts just with aggression and throwing things around the house. Um, so, it was really, it was a delicate situation with how to teach it. But we were eventually able to, um, to explain to him the appropriate place to do it like your bedroom or the bathroom and the places not to do it like the classroom. And he got it. So I, I do believe that there is, there are ways to get creative and, you know, the responsibility does go on the clinician or maybe the teacher or the school district to come up with these kinds of plans. Credit to you, because I think that only, it's only been since four years ago in which there was actually a social story teaching kids how to masturbate or two social stories, obviously. Um, and why, you know, when I would go to schools and I would say, look, you know, this is a problem. Just create one yourself. Yeah. And they wouldn't go near it. If a parent found out that I had drawn a penis or a vagina, okay, I'd be sued or I'd be out of a job. That was the response, you know, mm -hmm. and it was, it was just awful. And you're so right to bring up the problem of the big ones, you know, the, the, the big seven footers, you know, boys on the spectrum that are, you know, so challenging because the rules are so different for them and it's so sad. And again, it's just because everybody's scared. Yeah. Um, 
I have a story about that where there was one school I was consulting at in Milwaukee and um, the really challenged kids, they were just kind of laying around. I had a free period given to me. I said to the teacher, look, you're not doing anything with the kids. Give me the keys to the van. I'll take them to the mall. So mm -hmm. take keys, get them to the mall. We're all going around. Hey guys, whatever. The big guy, Jack, um, uh, he knew that mall. And what I had not been told or knew was that whenever he pa passes by the Auntie Anne's pretzel booth, that he always gets an Auntie Anne's pretzel. And it just couldn't work out in our particular visit. So like anybody else, Jack, you know, put his foot down and said, I'm really angry about this, but he did it in Jack's way, as opposed to the way that everybody else did. The whole mall freaks out. Mm. Whole mall freaks out. So we, you know, get back on the bus, head back to school. I had to report everything to, you know, um, the powers that be. And the principal's in a panic and he's just kind of like, you know, um, you know, we can never do this again. Never, never, never. These kids can never go to that mall again. And I, you know, was practically screaming at him. No, we have to do this more. Yeah. The reason why that happened was because sure. he had never had the experience of being said no to in that context or been in that mall and not having everything happen his way. And I just am really grateful to my boss, who was the special ed director, who backed me up 100% on that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's about um, having the opportunities to practice and be successful. Correct. 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 We need failures, too, to be successful. And that's one of the things that the helicoptering, you know, which is just a babysitting job for the parents sometimes, I'm sorry, you know, that the helicoptering does not help with. In order to process failure, we need to be comfortable with failure, not mm -hmm. avoid it. You know, we need to have had enough failures to understand that we're not going to die every time we fail, that, you know, we really can just pick ourselves up and everything's okay again. Yeah. So, Michael, we're going to have to wrap up here, but, you know, I'd like to close with a couple questions, actually. Sure. What advice would you give to an adult with autism who is out of the school system and maybe doesn't have an opportunity to have a systematic sex ed curriculum, um, but now as an adult is struggling to have a healthy sex life, what would you say to them? I would say, I can't say buy my book because it's not out yet. So <laughs> I would say start looking at some of the other books, which I can actually, if you would like, Rachel, I can give you a resource of other people's books that are available, yeah. some of which are technical, which I like, and others of which, you know, like, you know, if you're a little bit more advanced, you know, start listening to Dan Savage's Savage Love podcast, you know, read books like The Ethical Slut, you know, that happened a long time ago, you know, just some of these really fabulous, you know, sort of, you know, just groundbreaking things that just make you feel happy reading them as opposed to unhappy reading them. And mm -hmm. I can give you a list of those resources. But yeah, the reason why it doesn't exist is why I wrote the book. So I can't really answer that well. Right. So. But in general, just moving the conversation away from shame. Wow. I think that the more you understand how scared people that are not like you are about this subject, it will help you to understand that you don't have to be afraid of sex or sexuality or your desires. And if you want to go do your reading on how churches, politicians um, have so wrongly um, put such harmful attitudes on everything we're talking about here, especially the development of women and of you know women's biology um the cultural constructs that have butted heads you know with sexuality if you have the ability to do that kind of reading that's what makes you realize that you don't have to feel ashamed about all this stuff and that whoever told you to be ashamed was wrong mm -hmm. and that you do have a right to pleasure of any kind so long as somebody else doesn't get hurt as mm -hmm. long as it's, I would say one thing though, I would say the concept of informed consent, not just consent, informed consent. That's the only absolutely huge concept that everybody needs to understand, as well as how to apply a condom. Right. Girls and boys. 
Right. So this is great advice for adults who can read and who can understand these kinds of abstract yep. And so concepts. the others, I'm going to give you those books. And so what advice would you give to parents who maybe are still the caregivers of adults on the spectrum? I would say that their kids are sexual beings, no matter how challenged they are. I can point you to plenty of examples of people who are nonverbal um, and yet who have communicated in some other fashion other than speech that they are attracted to same-sex couplings um, or that are queer um, and that you know you don't have to have physical sex with anybody to just to realize that you're attracted um, to a certain category of people. Um, that everybody is a sexual being no matter how challenged they are. And that if they don't have the chance to explore that in some form or fashion, um, they're going to be very unhappy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all about that quality of life. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Michael. This has been a really interesting conversation. Rachel, thank you. Your questions were awesome. <laughs> thank you. How can people find out more about you? Um, I have one of those shamelessly self-promotional websites. It's www.michaeljohncarley.com. Very easy to uh, to figure that one out, and there's a contact me page at the on the far right far right thing on there, but you'll find it. Cool, yeah, I'll link all of the good stuff in our show notes. Cool, Rachel, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciated this. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. I acknowledge that the topics Michael and I discussed in this episode may make some people feel uncomfortable. However, it is important that we ask ourselves these questions as parents, clinicians, and teachers so that we aren't depriving individuals with disabilities of what could be a source of wonderful experiences. How can we approach sexual education in a way that is not shameful? How can we help preteens be prepared for bodily changes during puberty? How can we teach adolescents appropriate ways and places to masturbate? How can we instill the concept of informed consent? What skills do people with autism need in order to protect themselves and not harm others? How can we transform our social constructs to grant others their right to pleasure? Promoting a healthy attitude around sexuality may not only result in a safer environment, it may also increase quality of life. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.